My name is Patty Bernard. I'm a member of the Nevada Women's History Project. Today is Friday, August 18th. We are in Reno, Nevada, and we are interviewing Isabel Rodriguez Wilson, who is CEO of the Nevada Women's Fund. This interview is being done with the support of a Robert Z. Hawkins Foundation grant. Thank you so much for interviewing with us, Isabel. It's an honor to have you in our group of interviewees for the Nevada Women's History Project grant. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your formative years, your parents and families, schooling, where you grew up? I am a baby boomer. I was born in 1950 uh, to uh, my parents in Southern California. I am a third generation granddaughter of Mexican immigrants. And uh, in my formative years, I was uh, one, I was mother's oldest uh, while she was married. We had, she had two children. And then after that, they were divorced and she remarried. And in our blended family uh, with dad's ch child, I became second to the oldest and we became seven children. And so I'm second to the oldest of Mexican uh, immigrants, third generation, uh, born and raised in Southern California. And um, it was a challenging time because mother um, with a seventh grade education wasn't really sure uh, how she was going to go forward, but also had commitments to, when I say going forward, I mean, how her life was going to be and you know uh, being born in 1933 it was a really different uh, vision than women have today at that point she was going to somehow meet a man become a wife and and go on and have a family uh, she didn't know that she was going to stop going to school when she was in seventh grade uh, but because of the family demands on her side and her family they needed her to stay home and help take care of the children. And so at the seventh grade age of 13 or 14, I'm not quite sure exactly the age, she came home to take care of help take care of her sisters. And uh, at 16, she um, fell in love and uh, decided to elope. And I am her teenage daughter. Uh, I was born to my mother when she was, had just turned 17. And that's how mom and I began. What was your life like growing up and your schooling? Um, first, I will say on the growing up side, I didn't realize at the time that it was challenging. It was just what you did. I didn't know that there were other opportunities or other options because I didn't have role models in my family that showed another way other than being migrant family, having a large family, having everybody go to work, have everyone be a contributing part of the family. And so being mother's first child and mother's teenage birth, we became very codependent. And I just mentioned that mother had a seventh grade education. And she had a daughter who talked a lot she had a daughter who had a lot of questions and she had a daughter that just wouldn't stop being curious. And so naturally I, we became codependent. She depended on me greatly to be able to navigate things that she did not feel confident in navigating. We realized, I realize now, uh, you know, in retrospect, um, mother was brilliant and she had great talents and skills but she didn't have confidence and she didn't have self-esteem. And so she poured that into me uh, to be the navigator of life. And so as a result, we became very codependent. Um, I was her spokesperson. She felt like I um, was fearless when it came to talking with people I didn't know. She was more fearful of talking with people she didn't know. And so we seemed to be a good match. Uh, as I think back now, um, so those early years were, were burdened with a lot of responsibility because by the age of 24, in the blended family, my mother was a mother of six children at the age of 24. 
and I was the second to the oldest in the blended family. And so with many of us, she really took on a very traditional role um, in being housekeeper and budgeter and creative mom for all the children who wanted to do something. Turned out was I was the one who wanted the most. I wanted to dance, I wanted to go to camp, I wanted to do things that I was realizing my friends were doing. So my path then showed as I had more friends that there was different lifestyles than the one that I was having at home. So out of the seven children, I think I was the greatest demand for not only time, but also for financial resources. And so she had to be creative. And I didn't realize until many years later when she shared this, uh, and probably I'm, I'm going to speculate that she didn't share it because she didn't want me to feel bad. She was always didn't want anyone to feel they were a burden to the family. But when we were all asleep afterwards, when we were all in bed and the kids were all in, mother used to go out for a walk and she would look for um, glass bottles, you know, Coke bottles, when they, before cans and pop tops and things were available for recycling. There was recycling way back in the day, right? You could get five cents for this or you could get 25 cents for that. And so she went out and she would pull together whatever recycling items that she could find. It wasn't the term recycle then. And then she would cash them in for money so that she could make my costume or she could buy the fabric that she needed or she could put a few dollars together to buy used tap shoes. And so that was the early path with my mother. Uh, but because of that, uh, in retrospect and in hindsight, that time was really valuable because I did become a very responsible uh, child. And um, with her support, I flourished because I think she saw that I didn't have quite the lack of confidence that she did. Uh, and so she gave me a lot of room to explore. And through that curiosity then began many new things. Were you a good student? I was a good student uh, in elementary school. Um, she also shared that as a child I just learned very quickly and very early uh, relative to my other siblings. and. Um, it was easier for me somehow and I now that I think look back you know all of us individuals have really very individual brain patterns and mine as I think about it now just had this insatiable appetite for things unknown where mother may have been circumspect or humbled because our culture during that time being of Mexican descent uh, in Southern California was a bit challenging. Uh, there used to be a time when um, bilingualism was not encouraged and so she pulled that in and took that as a burden and asked me to stop speaking Spanish and only speak English so that I could be successful. Uh, but that was the tone in 1954 and 1955. So when I went to kindergarten I only spoke Spanish and it was in kindergarten that I learned how to speak English. And she asked me to no longer speak Spanish. And I did not speak Spanish again until I was 35 years old. And um, that was a little flavor. Um, through the formative years, um, I was active. I was active. I, I was like to do recreational. I was always at the recreation center and I was either dancing or I was choreographing. And then when I got into middle school, I was a cheerleader and a very happy, mother says, very happy child. And somehow I always felt included. I never felt excluded because of my culture or my ethnicity. I felt included. Uh, it never, I never felt like there was bias against me. And I'm not sure why that is. It's just that people accepted me as being a fun person to be with and a part of the team. I was a dancer, I mentioned, and I went into choreography. And then in middle school, again, I was a cheerleader and I was choreographing plays. And when I got to high school, um, 
you know, again, I was academically excelling and I uh, excelled in social activities as well because my friends really embraced me and I never really felt there was any discrimination or anything. I just didn't have that experience at that um, maybe critical years when you're teens and pubescence and you're moving through that. So when it came time to consider college, um, I didn't really think about college because there wasn't a role model in my life. There was no one in my, actually I was the first child to graduate from high school. My mother had not graduated, my stepfather, who really is my father, had not graduated, my grandparents had not gone to school, um, none of them had graduated. So in 1969, there was much celebration over Isabel's having accomplished her high school diploma. So that was a real goal for the family at the time, was to get the high school diploma and get the credential. There was no dialogue about moving on to um, you know, higher education and then maybe graduate work after that. They didn't even know the terminology. They didn't even know how to talk to me about it. And I didn't know how to ask about it because it wasn't in my vision. It was not in the out there. I was having a good time in high school. And then my friends started applying to college. And I remember saying to my father, I really want to go to college. But now as I think back, it was because my friends were going. It wasn't because I really had any goal at the time. <laughs> but we had this phenomenal conversation. My father sat down and he was, he was tearful. And he said, I can't help you because I don't know what to say and I don't know what questions to ask. All I know is that college costs money and we don't have it. And I said, oh, okay, I guess I'll go get a job. Related to this is I have a very clear memory of the when I was 16 years old. Uh, finances and money was really short. We were a, fairly poor family with very little and mother was a stay-at-home mom and dad was the only income. But at the age of 16 he needed to earn some extra income and so he went to do migrant work in the San Joaquin Valley and he looked at my sister and my two brothers and he said, you know, he looked at all of us because all of us would help bring in the load for uh, adding to the family. And I looked at my mother and I said, and them, and I said, do I have to go? And they said, well, no. And I said, I have a better idea. Let me stay home and take care of mom. And you all can go pick grapes and dust cotton and sort tomatoes. It just didn't seem like it was the right fit for me. Something in my system said, do, 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 do. And so I needed to do something that summer while everyone else was working. And so I went to Kelly Girls. And I lied on my application and said that I was 18 because I always looked older and I always acted older. So at the age of 16, I, I, will, I will reveal the secret now. I lied on my application and said that I was 18 and I had shorthand skills and I had typing skills and I became a Kelly girl at the age of 16. And that is really what launched my introduction to offices and clerical work and opened a world beyond migrant work or labor work. And um, that was my first introduction to um, kind of opening doors to, to new things. So uh, clearly that was something I've never forgotten at the age of 16. In high school, I really wasn't familiar with how to navigate uh, the resources that were available at the high school through counseling and not. And uh, there also was a time, and this is 1969, when um, Hispanics, not then called Hispanics, African Americans, not then called African Americans, really were seen as not viable candidates for higher education. And I think I just sort of assumed that. No one ever really said it to me, but I had the instincts that it just wasn't for me. And I was now a Kelly girl, and I was now working part-time, and that in the eyes of my family and the profile of my uh, relatives for generations before 
was a pretty darn good job if you could be in an office instead of picking grapes or oranges. To be in an office and taking shorthand was almost in their eyes like being an executive. And so that was really elevated and so I let go the option of considering college and I pursued everything through my office experiences and my office opportunities and therein began my career. So as I introduced myself and uh, I didn't force myself but I was never intimidated by the office environment and I think as I'm speculating now in retrospect that that was because I felt comfortable and confident in my skill set. I was in those days I was always the fastest, most accurate typist. I would just knock um, tests out of the water and they would say, can I watch you do that again? And my speed for typing was just fast and it was accurate. And I realize now that I really had a mind-hand coordination and an ability to think very quickly. And mother had shared that with me as well as that, you know, she realized that I could do things very, very quickly. So I got into office work. I, I became a secretary in Kelly Girls. And then uh, shortly thereafter, I applied to work at a law school because they had a secretary position available to work with the dean of the law school. It was Western State University College of Law. And um, and I went in and I just, here I am, just here I am. And I've interviewed and somehow people appreciated my personality or I conveyed confidence and they said, yes, we'll select you. And I became the Dean's secretary. At that time, actually, I was dating a childhood sweetheart. Um, I was dating a childhood sweetheart. We had met when we were nine years old. We used to be neighbors in a small town where we lived. We were next door neighbors. But we met again as we were, we knew each other as children. But we met again when he was about 16 and he was playing baseball. And uh, my father was active in baseball. And now that these young kids had grown up, my father was now playing against these boys in baseball. And I said to my mother, as we were always at the baseball field, her with her seven children and dad and the ice chest and always going out for an afternoon, I said, Mother, is that Raul on second base? And she looked at me and she said, yes, and best you leave it alone. And um, he's really stubborn and it's just not, just leave it alone. Well, fast forward, I married him. And um, when was this? I married him, uh, let's see, so we started dating when, and I was a senior in high school, and he did get accepted to college. He had been accepted to Cal State Fullerton as a freshman, and he was the first one in his family. He was also Latino. He was the first one in his family to go to college. Well, because my eyes are always big and I always have this insatiable appetite for the unknown and things that just I don't know, they make me ask questions. We were curious and I, I, I joined with him to support his efforts through, through college. Uh, so he, that was about 1969, 1970, and uh, we had a boyfriend-girlfriend relationship for three or four years while he was in college. And then he got accepted to Harvard Law School. And therein was a different chapter for me to consider. Uh, we'd been together for a really long time. We contemplated marriage. We decided it was a good thing to get married. And so what happened next for me was I married a law student who had been accepted to Harvard Law School. And I hooked myself to that. And then next thing you know, in 1973, I was married and on a big 747 jet from Los Angeles to Boston. And that was my first experience leaving the nucleus of my family and, and, and really thinking it was gonna be okay. Because times were changing and mom and dad just didn't understand that there was so much out there in the world to experience and so much to explore. And so we moved on. I went to Harvard as a supportive wife Today I will say I put him through Harvard Law School. 
banging those keys and taking shorthand, that was my core. That was really my core. And it's what saved me from the fields. It's what saved me from hard labor. It's really opened the doors. It's having the skill to do clerical and to be responsible and to adapt to a business environment. And somehow I just embraced it. It just felt right. It never felt wrong. It always felt right. So I arrived at Harvard in 1973 and worked for, uh, over those years, three Harvard Law School professors. Uh, one of them is Alan Dershowitz, uh, who we well know today, is uh, still a professor there, but certainly known for his uh, criminal justice. I also worked with Lawrence Tribe, who is a professor in constitutional law. And I worked with Professor Har, Charles Har, who, and all of these professors wrote the books for law schools that were accepted around the country. So I worked for Professor Har, who was uh, a professor at the law school in real, uh, real property. And I got my footing, and then I started my business, and I typed papers, and I typed briefs for students, and that's how I made a little extra money while I was putting my husband through Harvard Law School. Uh, so that you can see I've now gone from office and I've gone to a higher or learning institution. So Professor Har said to me one day, young lady, he goes, how do you get to be so smart? Through osmosis? And I said, well, sir, you know, I don't know. I just really enjoy this kind of an environment. And he really appreciated me and they brought me along. And Professor Har uh, provided a, um, a grant, now that I think back, Personally, he made it happen to award to get a grant awarded to my then husband, so we could come to Washington D.C. for a summer. And now that I think back, that opportunity was presented by him for me through my husband, because he was the student and he navigated it. But Professor Har wanted me to see more. And that summer, and I believe it was in the summer of 1975, um, I was in Washington, D.C. for the first time. Uh, part of that was a stint in Alaska. My then husband received a uh, clerkship, the judicial clerkship for the Supreme Court. And he said, what do you think about Alaska? And I said, well, I've never been there, Lord, let's go. I was always open to trying new things, going back to that insatiable appetite for the unknown and always wanting to try something new. And so we found ourselves in Alaska while he completed a judicial clerkship with the Supreme Court for the state of Alaska. And I worked as a secretary, still in the clerical for a law firm. It was at that time in 1976 that Jimmy Carter was elected president. And my then husband said, Oh my gosh, all my Harvard Law School classmates are going to Washington to work for the administration. I really would like to go. And I said, but I thought we were going to go home to Southern California and have babies and, and have a house and live like a lawyer and a lawyer's wife. I was really still in that mindset. And he said, no, I've changed your mind, so we're going to Washington, D.C. So I wrote mom and dad and said, I'm sorry, we're going to Washington, D.C. and we're not coming home first from the Latino side of the family and the nucleus is family in the Latino culture. It was a very sad time for the family and for me, but it also was just tantalizing, something new. I now realize there's a thread going through me that I just had to try something new. So we returned to, when we came to Washington DC in 1976 and he started work with the law firm and as did I as a legal secretary. And, um, as a legal secretary, I worked every aspect of the law and public policy that you could imagine with law firms. And I stayed with one law firm and enjoyed it very, very much. And they had great confidence in me. And I'm really sharing this thread of what men had great confidence in my ability because there were fewer women at that time. There were fewer women lawyers. I mean, when my husband was in law school, 3% of the enrollment was women in 1975. 3% of women were in graduate school or law school. And so when I came back to Washington, D.C., there were few women lawyers. There were few women lobbyists. 
There were few women leaders that you could look at that were heading organizations. Washington was a different time then. Didn't have so many nonprofits, didn't have so many lobbying groups, but it was growing during that time. But again, um, at the law firm, they um, appreciated my appetite for things new, and so new projects came my way. Uh, my then husband became active in the um, Mondale Ferraro campaign in 1984. I was not the politician. I was not the person who appreciated public policy. My comfort area was being the behind the scenes person making sure the documents got to court. I viewed myself that way. When my then husband said, you need to volunteer with the Mondale campaign. And I said, we had a big fight. I don't do campaigns, you do. I do clerical, you do policy. I really deferred a great deal, you do policy. And to please him, because that's where I was during that time, I went ahead and volunteered for the Mondale Ferraro campaign, totally a novice, totally unaware of what I was getting myself into, but knowing whatever was thrown at me, I would figure it out. Somehow internally I knew I would just figure it out. And so during that campaign, they really didn't have a lot of support system for the candidate's wife who was Joan Mondale at the time. So I started my political involvement with the Mondale Ferraro campaign, working with Joan Mondale in 1984 as what they call an advance person, getting to the location she was going to fly to in advance of her arrival to make sure that all the details were taken care of. And that was how I was introduced to Joan Mondale, who was a very, very different female candidate, uh, not I mean candidate, uh, representative of the, the candidate's spouse, the candidate's wife. It was more demure. You didn't talk politics. You really didn't do make compromising statements. It was being a gracious senator's wife who happened to be running for president. Joan always spoke about the arts. That was her comfort. She wanted to talk about the arts and how important that was. That was her sure footing. That campaign led to uh, working with Kitty Dukakis and Michael Dukakis in 1988. I received a phone call. Kitty was in Boston. They said, can you find Isabel? I hear that she's in Washington, D.C. She has this reputation of doing things really well. And I got a phone call, and I was asked to fly up to Boston to meet Kitty Dukakis. And she said, all right, I hear you're top notch. And I said, oh, thank you. But why am I here? She said, because I need for you to work for me. And I need to you to, for you to be in this campaign. So therein came, you know, I've had various female role models over the years. And they have evolved. There's just not one. It was watching women as I experienced my life and my career, how they were uh, making their own way. They were examples for me of how they were making their own way. Well, Kitty Dukakis was not Joan Mondale. We know that. She brought equality to the staff in the campaign, to the importance of where she would be in the campaign, and not to be undermined by men who thought that the candidate's time was more important than hers. And uh, I have a wonderful story associated with that, but maybe we'll keep that if you have more time for it. And then that led to my, and we lost that campaign. Obviously, we lost 1984 from the Democratic side of the ticket and, and 1988. Uh, by 1992, I was divorced. And I got a phone call from the Clintons. And they said, we hear you're top notch and we need for you to get involved in the campaign. And I said, I would appreciate doing that, but I don't want to travel anymore. I'd like to direct. So I became Hillary Clinton's um, advanced director and Tipper Gore's advanced director. After my divorce, I then um, I drove down to Little Rock after the convention and I stayed there during the general election. And um, I ran the advance and scheduling operation for, uh, for uh, Hillary and for Tipper. Clearly now Hillary was a very different spouse of a candidate than Joan Mondale or um, Kitty Dukakis. Now we're talking policy input. Now we're talking, you know, woman with uh, established credentials, and who was a partner with her with her husband, who involved her in conversation. 
And so it was a very different experience to see the evolvement of a of a the spouse, the role of the spouse of the presidential candidate. And so I've had the privilege of working with three women who opened my eyes to a great deal. It was Hillary Clinton who said, would you please come and serve us at the White House? I have told the president-elect that it is you who should run the White House Office of Scheduling and Advance Operations. And that is how I ended up at the White House. It was fascinating being around many, many high-powered women. Uh, I had the experience of meeting Madeleine Albright in 1984 before she became the Secretary of State. I had opportunities of meeting uh, accomplished women who were really breaking new ground between 1984 and 1992. It was, uh, it was a different time. Uh, my lack of a higher education and a formal education with credentials in a field of study was ever present with me, always. And part of that challenge was that um, I was also at the same time in, in this marriage that was not a healthy marriage. It was not healthy. It was, um, it was not anything that boosted my self-esteem or my confidence. It was more uh, derogatory and um, uh, more directed toward helping him, the energy that he would give, and I succumbed to it. I didn't know how to handle it because I valued marriage and I wanted to be married very long. And I didn't realize that my marriage was not healthy. So it was not a positive time for me to think that uh, I could go to school and do this. And I frankly will be really honest now, he had a Harvard degree. And I never thought that I could ever accomplish that. And he reminded me that I would never accomplish that. And so I kind of knew my place. Uh, but was it challenging? Yes. I think, you know, for many overachievers, and I'll put myself in that category, for many overachievers, there's a lot of lack of self-confidence and some self-esteem. It's like somehow we always have to prove that we're going to make it and we can do it. And now I realize that the learned behavior and the learned um, uh, examples of my mother she had no self-esteem because she had a seventh grade education. She didn't have confidence to speak English even though she spoke it beautifully uh, because she really felt she only had a seventh grade education. And now I realize that passed right on to me, but it was a different level. I only had a high school diploma. I didn't have a degree. I didn't go to law school. And so it was a similar behavior of being with little self-esteem and confidence, but it was at a different level of credential. And so I had to push through it because I didn't want to cry. I didn't want to disappoint. I think it was more that if I, if I search for the real emotion, I didn't want to disappoint anyone. And so what did I do? I read. And what did I do? I asked questions. And then what did I do? And this is long before Google and researching and all of these things. I wasn't a hugely avid re reader, but I had good friends and good friendships and good uh, role models that I could say, how can I get through this? I'm really not feeling good about the fact that I don't have a degree. And um, there were options that were put before me. Uh, frankly, without going into great detail, my lack of going forward on the higher education was mostly associated with my first husband. Uh, it just wasn't acceptable. He said, if you really want this, you can do it at night, do it on the weekends, do it early in the morning, but you still got to work. And I just went on, and I just went on, and then here I am today, and do I have regrets even today? You talk about role models. Obviously, those first ladies were role models, but who are some of your other role models? I have to say that, you know, I was really thinking about this question, and I, I realize I don't have one role model uh, because every person that I, I, I watched, I, I, um, I listened to, were different. They were different people at different times of my life. And uh, I have started with my grandmother. My grandmother had uh, four children, 
And my grandfather came to her in 19, I don't know, 19, 1943, 45 or something around there. And he said he wanted to leave her and he wanted to go live with another girlfriend that he had. And um, my grandmother, and so he wanted to do that, but he wanted to see his family on the weekend. And my grandmother said, no. And the very next day, she went and saw a lawyer, and she got a divorce in 1945. And she said, no, that's not acceptable. Um, these children need a father, and if you're going to go and play, then go and play, but be gone. And I thought, wow, later, how decisive of her. She didn't, she didn't waver. She knew that it was important for the structure of the family and for her self-esteem. She wasn't going to have that happen. Now, an interesting story is that he did return and they did remarry and they stayed together for the balance of their lives. Uh, so the second role model was my mother. When I think about, I couldn't imagine being 24 years old with seven children. I just can't even imagine and one income and trying to figure out how to make it all work and how to extend the meals and how to uh, accommodate the requests of your children. I just, I can't even imagine that. So oftentimes as I was going forward, I thought about my mom and I thought if mother can collect Coke bottles or glass bottles and recycle and do those, I can do this. I think it was on her foundation of strength that I realized if she could do that, that seemed much harder for me than typing. So I can do this. And, and so mother was a great role model for me. I remember in my high school when I took uh, business classes because I definitely didn't want to be a field worker. And so my business teacher became a role model for me. And to this very day, in 2017, I can remember sitting in the classroom with her and her telling me and sharing with me about how to go forward. And I absorbed every bit of it. So when I left high school, I had those typing skills. I had those shorthand skills that for that time and for that generation, they were skills that were, they were skills that were important because those were the jobs we held back then. You know, those were the levels of professionalism that we were in. Not everybody, but a fair amount of us at that time. Uh, as I became involved in, um, in uh, uh, putting my husband through Harvard Law School, I really appreciated the four women I knew that were law students. And one of them was of um, Mexican descent. And she had been um, refused to come back home because she had left home to go to Harvard Law School. Today, that's unimaginable. Back then, for a young Hispanic girl to leave her home was unheard of regardless of whether it's Harvard or Oxford or any fine institution. It was really a quandary for those of us in this culture to violate the, the desire of our family for a higher education. So those women became my role models. They tried to help me, but I struggled a little bit. I didn't have the confidence to be able to push forward. Then when I became involved in political campaigns, then I realized that Joan Mondale was as nervous as I was. She had been the senator's wife for very long and she wouldn't have been disappointed if it had stopped. And I saw her push through what she was being asked of her. My role model then was Kitty Dukakis, who said, I will not have my staff be treated separately and differently than the presidential candidate's staff. I want Isabel at the table. Then I saw Hillary Clinton Hillary Clinton was an entirely different spouse of the candidate. And it was Hillary, I mentioned, who said to the president-elect, Isabel will run this office. But I met Madeleine Albright, and since then, you know, there's Condoleezza Rice that we saw that's remarkable. Um, Marion Wright Edelman I worked with. Marion Wright Edelman hired me at one point to do a major project for her. And I thought, what an amazing woman to be of African-American you know, African descent to have married a Caucasian man, to have biracial children during a time when it was just remarkable to do that. And she is a leader for children's um, equality and benefits and all that are important to our youth so that they grow to be healthy adults.
And I'd like you to identify who she is for our audience. Marion Wright Edelman is the founder and today still remains the CEO of the Children's Defense Fund. It is a national organization that has done advocacy to support uh, children in need for, oh my gosh, it's got to be 50 years. And she's still there and uh, a remarkable woman. To see Madeline Albright go from a staff person and knowing that international affairs was her focus and to be tagging along in the mail, behind the men, you know, having to be in the meetings and to see her ascend and move to Secretary of State, absolutely amazing because it, it, it hasn't been easy, not for any of these women. Um, also for um, Janet Reno, the Attorney General, Janet Reno under uh, President Clinton's administration you know, ascending to become the Attorney General of the United States, and I think she was the first woman Attorney General in she our country. I believe she was. Yes. So these are role models, but I also had a lot of inspiration. I like reading biographies of women and their road and their path and how they got to where they were. And oddly enough, guess what? They struggled just like me. So I really found some connection there, that it really didn't matter what your topic was, whether you're a secretary coming into the Harvard Law School or you were the attorney general coming into the administration, all of us have apprehensions and we're not sure and we're fearful of the unknown, but they pushed forward. A magnificent autobiography is that of Catherine Graham, who inherited the Washington Post. Um, Barbara Walters has a magnificent memoir about her struggles in media and negotiating contracts uh, for them to be recognized and to even be considered as anchors in, in their work. So now these are, um, Andrea Mitchell I think is another one, she has a wonderful uh, autobiography of her time in very recent times and she was married to the Federal Reserve Chair. Uh, very fascinating, so those are my role models today. I'd like to take you back just simply because it is so uh, unusual, but so important to your high school typing teacher. What was her name? Her name was, oh my gosh, Betty. Her first name was Betty. I'm going to say, I believe it was Crawford. It was Betty Crawford. And I actually, my high school um, physical education teacher made a trip to Washington, D.C. And I always, used whatever access I had to share with everybody because you should share it with everybody. So after uh, my physical ed teacher um, suggested I come to see Betty, I did exactly that. Uh, I came home from Washington, I was now divorced, and I was uh, in Washington, D.C. And I came home and I went to see her at the high school. I said, I'm just going to go over to the high school, which oddly enough looked really small now. Right? It seemed like a, it was a bigger building somehow when I was there, but now it was small. And I went to the office and they, I said, she's, they said, this is her classroom. And I went to her classroom and she wasn't there. And uh, remember, I was there in, at the high school in 19, about 68 when I was with Betty and she was instructing me on business skills. And so now I'm back and it's like 1995, roughly, 94, 95, just roughly. Uh, or 96 and I go back so high school's changed a little bit in that block of time and she's not in her classroom and they said well she usually goes to the back of the classroom uh, uh, and to take a break in between classes and so I walked around the side of the building and there she was sitting by herself and smoking a cigarette at that time which seemed to be acceptable and we don't see that anymore and I said Betty and she said, yes. She didn't recognize me. And I said, I'm Isabel from your business class in 1968 or 67. And she said, oh, hello. Really, she'd had so many students and she was still teaching. And I, share, I mentioned to her that my physical ed teacher had come to Washington, D.C. And I told her how much Betty was so important to me. And I said, you know, um, Gosh, I can't remember her name, but I will think of her name. Uh, she came to Washington, and I told her how important you were to me, and I wouldn't be where I am today 
and she suggested I come and see you and it was perfect and I want to come back and personally say thank you and she cried and I cried and she said it makes me so happy because school is so hard today look at these young kids they're kissing in the hallway and then <laughs> she had some concerns about where society was going with young high school children so I listened to her because she deserved to be listened to and I said just remember there are always students that are touched by you in one way or in another and I want you to see that I am one of those students and I brought her a gift from the White House and she was thrilled and we hugged and we said goodbye and it was the last time I saw her. She died shortly after that and died, uh, battled cancer and died after that. So um, I find myself in Washington DC after all of these years. I'm a Southern California girl from a Mexican American family. What the heck am I doing in Washington DC working at the White House? And uh, I had been in Washington, D.C. long enough before getting my assignment to work for the Clintons. I actually entered the White House as the deputy assistant to the president, which is the senior position advisor to the president, on scheduling and advance operations. And what that means, and I'm gonna, uh, there's a reason I'm saying this, what that means is that as director with my team, I was responsible for everything the president did from the time how he got anywhere from the time he and she too Hillary too from the time they woke up in the morning until they went to sleep at night whether they were in the United States in the White House complex or around the world so I found myself without a passport at the White House and suddenly I was the director of international moving the president on Air Force One and I had no passport um, and I it's when I discovered you can get a passport in about 10 minutes <laughs> If you've been accepted and you have a security clearance, if you know somebody. You know somebody. <laughs> and so in the White House, I then, we entered in the inauguration on January 20th, it's filled with many stories there. But by May, I found myself on a, a White House plane on the way to Japan to prepare for the president's first meeting at the G7 in Tokyo, Japan. And that uh, began two and a half years of just amazing travel and experiences, sleepless nights, you know, no eating and all those types of things that you do to stay in the mix, to be able to keep your spoke in the wheel. Did yeah. you ever pinch yourself and say, what am I doing? Well, of course I will, because, you know, whenever, like when I was on Air Force One once, I called my sister for her birthday because I was pinching myself and I knew she'd be thrilled if she got a phone call from Air Force One wishing her happy birthday. And as a senior officer, I could do that. And I could ask the staff, would you please dial this number and get my sister on the phone? And my sister said, somebody in her office said, somebody's on the phone and says that they're on Air Force One calling for you. And then nobody knew that my sister had a sister that worked at the White House. And my sister was like, oh, my goodness. And so I shared it that way because I was pinching myself. There I was on my way to Korea, you know, on one trip and going over the waters before we landed in Korea. And I said, this is not happening to this high school graduate Mexican girl from Southern California. Absolutely, every bit of the way, from the inauguration until I made the conscious decision to actually leave the assignment. So what I did for that time, for three years at the White House, it was I was senior advisor to the president for making sure my counterparts and my planning team was the U.S. Secret Service, the United States State Department, and the National Security Council. And I was the head of the delegation managing all of these forces to prepare for the leader of the free world to travel wherever he goes in the world. And the details are immense, uh, the intensity is great, and the results, if not done well, can be uh, not only daunting, but devastating. And so I did that, but having been in Washington for many years, I knew that the White House was, a, was an experience, it wasn't a career. Because I had seen presidents come and go, and I had seen staff come and go. And so I elected to leave the White House uh, after three years, but there were two very important critical pieces that made me think about that. I was so busy I forgot my mother's birthday. For two months I forgot my mother's birthday. And I called home one day and my dad said, oh I guess you're calling home to say happy birthday to your mother. 
And number two, I missed my best friend's wedding. I couldn't go to the wedding. And that's what really shook me and made me say, where is your balance in life? And will you be one of those people who just hangs on to this ride until the end? Or will you be a person that has the experience and moves it on to something else? And so I left the White House not knowing what I was going to do and decided that I would form my own business. And I formed my own business and I was able to get involved in public policy matters that were really true to my heart. And so I created an event management business and it was me. And this is in Washington, This is in Washington, D.C. I've now divorced and I have my own home and I've left the White House. I now have credentials. I now have respect. I have uh, acknowledgement for the work that I do, that it's solid in its quality. And so I decided to do to go off. Well, it turns out that one of the clients for the firm, the law firm I used to work with, wanted to hire me to do some marketing for them. And so I took them on as a client. And then from that, uh, my next event was working with Marion Wright Edelman. I brought you Stand for Children uh, and back in, I think it was 1994. And um, no, it was 1995. I brought you Stand for Children. She wanted to bring awareness to the legislature how important it was to provide federal dollars to help kids. Again, her mission was children and youth. And so um, she asked me to do an event for her. And so in Washington, D.C., in the National Mall, at the Lincoln Memorial, that's where she wanted it to be. And you, there's, you, know, you work with the whole Park Service and everything. And so I created a major demonstration at in, in, in that time called Stand for Children and brought 350,000 people to demonstrate in Washington in support for children. And that started my career in major event planning. And shortly after that, I was hired by Michael Milken and General Schwarzkopf to do an event called the March Coming Together to Conquer Cancer. They wanted awareness on the importance of federal dollars for research on cancer. And then I received a phone call from a woman named Donna Dees. And Donna Dees was a publicist for, um, uh, who's the nighttime host, uh, David Letterman. She was a publicist for him. She was outraged that there were no regulations for gun safety. And we had just experienced Columbine, and we had just experienced the National Zoo in Washington have a shooting, and Los Angeles had experienced the young children in the preschool that had been attacked, and it was a horrible, horrible vision. And she said, I need to find Isabel. And she found me, and I am the producer and the event planner for the Million Mom March in 2000 on Mother's Day to bring awareness on the need for gun safety not gun control, gun safety, so that we could have safe families. You know, sporting could still be done. Um, the argument being, if you need a driver's license to drive a car, could you at least get some sort of a license to own a gun? And so uh, we accomplished 800,000 people demonstrating in Washington, D.C. on the need for that public legislation. And these were pieces that were really dear to my heart, and I was able to do that. My final piece was receiving a phone call from the former president and first lady and the president said, uh, Isabel, what, what are you doing? I said, well, sir, I'm been trying to relax. I'm in Washington, D.C. And he said, would you please uh, open the presidential library for me? And he asked me, and Hillary asked me if I would please coordinate the opening of the 12th presidential library in our history. We, at that time, in uh, 2004, it was the 12th presidential library. And so I said, yes, sir, I will do that. And I flew back and forth between Washington, D.C. and um, Little Rock. And I opened the presidential library with all former presidents and, um, and uh, all former cabinet officers. And uh, previous to that, I also worked with General Powell, General Colin Powell and all the living presidents when they launched America's Promise because they wanted to bring volunteerism and social responsibility uh, from corporations to provide community support. And so at this stage now I have become a role model and I have become recognized for my work. And 
it was humbling experience to be at that level and to finally be the woman in the room telling the men in the room what they needed to do. Uh, it was then in, 19, in 2004, after I opened the library, I actually had a new relationship. And this is a, a new chapter, but I will share this, is I battled cancer after I did the cancer march. I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And uh, I battled breast cancer for a year. And I had been divorced for probably about nine years at that time when I uh, was diagnosed with breast cancer. And um, I was out with my caregivers, friends one night, and, they, and I met my husband. And the next chapter is that my husband, uh, I wasn't ready for this, but my husband is um, 19 years younger than I am. And it presented a new question for me. Was I willing to take on societal barriers to what had been normal practice with men and younger women, but rarely seen with older women and younger men? So I began a relationship with uh, my now husband. And we've now been married 11 years. And I had no children in my first marriage. And through the uh, science of IVF and surrogacy, I, with my current husband, I have an eight and a half year old son. And it's the most remarkable experience of my life. So one might ask how I got to Reno from Washington, D.C after I completed the opening of the library and in a new relationship with my, my new love, uh, he looked at me and he said, let's get out of Washington and try something new. And as usual, you've heard my pattern, sure, why not? Let's go try something new. And I uh, decided to end my Washington DC time and try to return to the West Coast. Uh, times had changed dramatically in Southern California since I had left. Traffic, growth, extensions, huge communities, it wasn't appealing any longer to try to get back to Southern California. And we decided we would explore. And a friend sent an email and said, the Boys and Girls Club of North Lake Tahoe in Kings Beach is looking for a director. And I said, what a wonderful place to tuck away. I think the top at the, at the 12 o'clock at Lake Tahoe just sounds like a beautiful sight to me. I didn't know anything about Reno. I didn't know anything about Nevada. I just knew that they had more than 320 days a year of sunlight and that was my place. And so my uh, fiance and I decided whoever got the assignment first, that's where we would go. And so I came to, I flew in and I interviewed and I landed in Reno, never having been here before. And I drove up to Lake Tahoe and I had an interview and they questioned why I would be living, leaving such an exciting life. And I said, can my cup not be full? Can I not transition to other wonderful things and bring this wealth of experience to other uh, exciting projects? Youth development was my passion. As I explained my career, I took youth with me always. I had no children, so I always took youth with me. So um, I interviewed, and darn, they hired me. And I looked at my fiance and I said, I got the job, I got the job. I'm gonna be the director of the Boys and Girls Club of North Lake Tahoe. So we're moving to Reno. And sure enough, sold the house, got in the car. January 27th, 2005, I landed here in, um, in, in Reno. We opted to, decided to live in Reno, but I would drive to the lake and for the experience. And I was the director of the Boys and Girls Club of North Lake Tahoe uh, for seven and a half years. And it was during that time that my son was born and came to us through the magic of IVF. And I realized as he was getting bigger, I needed to find a place in, um, in Reno and come down from the mountain. And I just felt confident that if I could just be patient, that something would happen and something would, we'd gone through the, uh, through the uh, reset, I mean, through the economic downfall and things were, as we all know, very challenging in 2008. So I would just be comfortable and I would just wait and be patient. And lo and behold, there was an announcement that the Nevada Women's Fund was looking for a CEO. And I looked at my husband and I said, that's my next assignment. I really want that assignment. Why? It was for all that I've shared. It's because of my life and my chapters as a woman. It's my generation as a woman. It's going from baby boomer to present time 
breaking barriers. And I knew that every woman at the Women's Fund had their story. And I knew that they would share some, maybe, maybe with their friends, maybe with their family, maybe with their spouses and significant others, and maybe none at all. There just might be one right here that we take with us forever. And I had a passion for the road of women and it's the right fit. It's a place that I feel I can bring all of my skills, all of my experience, all of my relationships, all of my knowledge to bring awareness about the importance of women in our society and providing opportunities that were halted for a while where those barriers are now broken down. We still have a long way to go, but we're on our way. And that is my passion for the Nevada Women's Fund. I will be there until I cannot walk anymore. Messages I would have for young women, explore it all. Do not be fearful of the door of the unknown. Do not be fearful of the unknown. It's only the unknown. The minute you choose to open the door and explore what's on the other side, you now have done more than the person who chooses to not open the door. And guess what? When you get to the other side of the door of the unknown, there's another door. It is your choice to open the door and have a phenomenal experience. So go for it. Regardless of topic, go for it. Thank you very much.